Okay, thank you for this introduction. Um, so as Simon already announced, uh, the title of my presentation is N-type doping of metal hypers, guys through dopant oxidation. And I thought uh, I would uh, introduce uh, myself uh, before. Hmm. Why did it block? Ah, okay. So I thought that uh, before I uh, start talking about Perskites, I will talk about myself <laughs> for uh, a couple of seconds. Uh, so I come from uh, Poland, but I love Italy, so I didn't miss an opportunity to go there, uh, even if it was for studying. Um, so I did my first internship in Palermo. Uh, in Sicily, South Italy, and then I spent one uh, semester of Erasmus uh, at the University of Florence. After my master's, uh, during which I worked at Polish Academy of Science, I moved to Bordeaux for a PhD, and uh, today you will um, listen to uh, the, some of the results, the presentation of some of the results uh, from my PhD. And uh, after I finished my PhD, at the end of last year, I stayed for a postdoc at the same institution. So uh, today's presentation, I divide it into four sections. Uh, first, uh, the introduction, of course. Then I will talk about the, um, my approach for doping using metastable ions. Next, I will talk about the characterization of the doped uh, perovskite layers, and I will finish with conclusions and perspectives. Uh, so uh, Vincent told me that everybody knows perovskites here. Then I will just um, bring up quickly some of the some of the applications of uh, perovskite semiconductors. Uh, and um, also, I would like to um, notice here that uh, we are, um, I hope, at the beginning of the new generation of the perovskite development that is associated with the perovskite doping. And this could uh, bring us the advantages of silicon with, uh, this could combine the advantages of silicon where we have uh, well-controlled doping with the advantages of perovskite, such as low costs and the possibility of uh, printing uh, perovskite layers on uh, uh, flexible substrates. Mm, this could also enable to make a fully perovskite transistor, and uh, these are just some of the exciting um, options that we have once we uh, control the doping. However, the story of uh, perovskite doping is not as simple as in case of silicon because of the ionic character of the perovskite crystal. So if we want to introduce the heterovalent dopants into the perovskite uh, crystal lattice, just like we do in case of silicon, we will encounter the presence of the counter ion that will cancel the effect of doping. Therefore, um, some alternative approaches have to be applied. And one of these approaches is uh, developed from, derives from uh, the organic semiconductors and uh, it is um, molecular charge transfer doping. In this example, we have um, a four, uh, F4 TCNQ molecule uh, that uh, has the LUMO level lower, lower than the valence energy of the perovskite, and uh, this enables an efficient uh, hole transport. Um, resulting in the shift of the Fermi level towards the valence energy and the conductivity increased by around five orders of magnitude, which is uh, accompanied by the increase of hole density. Um, this is uh, one of the best uh, examples of doping uh, with the highest increase of conductivity so far. And this is, uh, of course, for P-type doping. When it comes to heterovalent doping, there was... Uh, an attempt in 2016 to dope uh, single crystals of methamonium lead bromide with uh, bismuth 3 plus. And in this case, we can see already that uh, in this uh, graph, we can see that the doping was actually very inefficient, but it's expected for the um, for perovskites to uh, for the for the impurities to be very difficult to introduce because since we are dealing with the ionic crystal this is some sort of self purifying system so naturally impurities must be very difficult to introduce and here we observe that the amount of bismuth uh, in the uh, crystal 
is just a fraction of the amount of bismuth introduced in the feed solution. Nevertheless, uh, the increase of conductivity was observed by around four orders of magnitude and the increase of majority charge carry concentration by around two orders of magnitude. And this was um, concluded to be due to uh, the narrowing of the band gap. As we can see uh, here, the color of the crystal darkens, and this was associated to the narrowing of the band gap, which was, of course, um, also supported by the UVVS uh, absorption spectra. Nevertheless, uh, two years after that, the group of uh, Professor Miyasaka uh, made a similar sample and measured the photoluminescence. And uh, they showed that photoluminescence peak occurs exactly at the same energy for all the doping concentrations. It means that the band gap doesn't really change. What they observed was the decrease of the photoluminescence peak intensity and the widening of the peak, which uh, is normally associated with the increase of the defects in the crystal lattice. From this, we can conclude that the increase of conductivity that was observed in this experiment probably uh, comes from the increase of the defects uh, localized close to the band edges. Uh, so as you can see, uh, heterovalent doping is a very tricky one. So for my PhD uh, thesis, uh, we had a little bit also tricky approach. Uh, so the, the approach that we used was to substitutionally, uh, to substitute uh, lead, so to dope substitutionally, uh, and to use... Um, a homovalent dopant, so two plus metal, but we wanted to choose the metal that would be metastable. So once introduced into the um, perovskite crystal structure, it would oxidize to three plus and release one electron to the conduction band. This electron obviously would increase the um, electron uh, density, uh, leading to the shift of the Fermi level, leading to the n-type uh, semiconductor. Um, so this sounds great, and uh, uh, for this we had to select the right dopant, so there are two criteria that had to be uh, followed, the first criteria uh, satisfied, the first criterion was obviously the metastability of the dopant at the 2 plus and stability at the 3 plus, and the second was the size of the ionic radius. In this table I presented some of the potential candidates. Uh, with the ionic radius uh, similar to the ionic radius of uh, lead 2 plus. And today I will present the results of uh, for some ion. So in the first experiment, uh, I mix the precursors of uh, the perovskite together with the precursors of the dopant. So in this case, some ion uh, 2 iodide. Uh, spin coated them, annealed obviously, and I measured the lateral conductivity with uh, symmetrical uh, gold electrodes. And I observed a slight uh, increase of conductivity, let's say up to nine times increase of conductivity, uh, but also a big spread of results. So um, we thought that hmm, there is water in the lead precursor and um, everything happens in DMF. Uh, samarium iodide is known to be very reactive and doesn't like moisture, definitely. So how about we make the perovskite first and then once everything is dry and clean, then we introduce the dopant. So that's exactly what I did. Um, so I called it two-step doping with samarium. So first I spin coat um, perovskite, and I spin coat uh, samarium iodide, and I need again. Um, the conductivity of the sample prepared that way increased by around two orders of magnitude compared to undoped. And also I measured uh, as a control the conductivity of the layer of samarium iodide alone to make sure that the increase of conductivity comes from the combination of uh, the perovskite and the dopant, and does not, it's not just the, con the conductivity of the dopant alone. 
And by scanning different uh, doping, concentra doping concentrations, I reached around three orders of magnitude increase in conductivity. And uh, I observed the increase of conductivity in all the experiments that I performed. So it was a very reproducible method. So once I knew uh, the right, uh, per, uh, the right uh, dopant and the right method for doping, uh, there come, here comes the time to characterize the layer and to answer some questions. So the first question was the valency of the dopant. And for this, uh, typically we use XPS. Um, other dopant characterization that I did was um, the... Uh, atomic profile using also XPS uh, edged with uh, argon clusters and uh, tough sims. I performed uh, some complementary characterization that uh, includes the investigation of the topology of the sample, uh, crystal structure, so XRT. Also, I made uh, UVVs absorption spectra and uh, photoluminescence. And uh, as last, I made the uh, investigations of the electrical properties, uh, such as um, surface potential difference, UPS, and also charge carrier density using Mott-Schott key and Hall effect. So the first question that I already mentioned uh, was about the valency of the dopant. So for that, I did the XPS of the samarium iodide layer, and here, Obviously, we notice, unfortunately, we already have samarium 3 plus in our samarium 2 plus um, doping, dopant. Um, it's probably due to very high uh, uh, reactivity of uh, samarium iodides. Well, it's unavoidable. Nevertheless, uh, there is still a substantial amount of samarium 2 plus. And what's important, this samarium 2 plus peak is not present for uh, any the, on any of the doping concentration. Um, another thing is that uh, the peak associated to some M3 plus shifted uh, towards higher bending energies, suggesting a different environment of the samarium in the samarium iodides and in the perovskite layer. And this is a very nice hint that uh, samarium might actually really be incorporated into the perovskite crystal structure and not stand as a mixed phase samarium iodide and perovskite. Mm. As a control uh, experiment, I also prepared samarium 3 iodide and I doped uh, the perovskite layer using the same technique and I observed uh, none to insignificant in increase of conductivity in this case, showing again that it must be samarium 2 plus and not 3 plus to use for the doping. Mm. One second. The same technique, SPS, uh, was used to investigate uh, the atomic composition uh, in the, the atomic profile of the perovskite, of the top materials. And um, <clears throat> here we can see, both on XPS and on TOFSIMS uh, profiles, we can observe increased, uh, an increased amount of uh, samarium uh, close to the surface, which is uh, perfectly justified by the method used uh, for the doping. Nevertheless, there is uh, a substantial amount of samarium close to the bottom of the layer, and this was confirmed by both techniques. Um, using uh, the XPS, uh, we calculated that the amount of uh, uh, samarium is around 21%, which corresponds to 10 to the power of 20 uh, per centimeter square dopant density, which is uh, in fact a little high for the, um, uh, for the standard definition of doping. Uh, therefore, we investigated further. But before that, uh, we investigated the topology of the sample, and we can see that as expected, um, the surface was changed upon doping. There are probably some residues of samarium iodide or samarium oxide on the surface. 
Um, and the zero milligram per milliliter, I forgot to mention earlier, this is the sample that is treated with the solvent of samarium iodides, just to make sure that the um, solvent alone doesn't alter the properties of the perovskite. Um, so for other, regarding other uh, key properties of perovskite, here we have the XRD, pattern, and it shows a typical MAPI, the trigonal pattern, that doesn't change upon doping, except for the highest doping concentrations, where we clearly can see some peaks that stand for most probably a phase separation of uh, a phase separation. And this probably stands for a decrease of conductivity for the highest doping concentration. Another very interesting thing we can see after zooming in to the principal peak of um, the samples that show the increase in conductivity. And here we can see uh, that the principal peak shifted a little bit towards lower angle. Um, this shows probably lattice expansion upon doping. And uh, from this, we can uh, conclude, or guess, that uh, probably the dopant, introduced dopant is in the uh, valency of 2 plus, causing lattice expansion. Uh, and uh, after crystallizing, it oxidizes to 3 plus. This is one of the possible explanations. Mm. Other key properties, just like band gap, uh, were also measured from the UVV spectra. And uh, this is also typical for MAPI and didn't change upon doping. Mm. Photoluminescence uh, occurs uh, at 780 nanometers, which is also typical for MAPI. And also we observe a complete quenching of the photoluminescence signal for all the doping concentrations that we uh, discussed so far. Uh, as much as this is perfectly consistent with doping, it was interesting to investigate what happens in for the intermediate uh, doping concentrations. Uh, so for this, I also prepared uh, one half 0 0.1 and 0 0.05 milligrams per milliliter doping. Uh, and uh, we can observe, in fact, uh, partial quenching for uh, 1 and 0 0.5 milligrams per milliliter. But interestingly, for very low concentrations, such as 0 0.1 milligrams per milliliter and 0 0.05, we observe an increase in the photoluminescence uh, peak intensity. This can originate from two phenomena. One is that extra electrons, a small amount of extra electrons injected into the perovskite structure fill the traps, and uh, this allows, this leads to the higher photoluminescence. And another is um, the, that in some reports, MAPI, undoped MAPI is a little bit p-doped. And if this is the case, then injection of extra electrons would shift the Fermi level more towards the intrinsic semiconductors. Yes. So now one of the most uh, interesting uh, parts, uh, the investigation of the semiconductor type, which can be typically done with uh, using UPS. Um, and uh, from the onset of uh, the UPS spectrum, we can find uh, the work function. Uh, and here we can see that the work function uh, decreases with the doping concentration. Uh, however, we have to remember that uh, just the decrease of the work function doesn't necessarily mean uh, in type doping. For this, uh, to to ensure this, we have to take a look at the valence band region. Uh, and in this case, we can observe that the absolute value of the energy with respect to the Fermi level increases with the doping concentration. I took this, these two results together and I 
put them on this graph to make it all clear. And from this, we can see that uh, the um, Fermi level of the undoped MAPI falls uh, almost exactly in the middle of the bank gap. And uh, we can observe a slight shift of the Fermi level towards the conduction energy uh, as the, the concentr doping concentration uh, increases. And for the um, for 10 milligrams per milliliter, we can observe around 0.5 electron volt shift towards the conduction energy. Also, we can observe a small uh, surface dipole of around 0.3 electron volts. And this is probably uh, due to the doping method and the residues of uh, some arium species on the top, which we could observe, for example, on the IFM and some images. So, now let's go to the investigation of the charge carrier density. And uh, for this, there are two techniques uh, that are used. One uh, is Hall effect and the other is smart shot key. So uh, for, to measure the Hall effect, we collaborated uh, with a semi-lab company from Hungary. And uh, we measured uh, my sample in the Hall bar configuration. Now the Hall effect, uh, Probably everyone, most of the people know, but just to remind, it's the effect on the semiconductor or conductor where the charge uh, deflects in the magnetic field when the in the flow of current. And so when we have this deflected charge, we can measure the difference, potential difference, so voltage. And this voltage is obviously proportional to the current and to the magnetic field, inversely proportional to the thickness. Also, there's a proportionality factor that's called the whole factor, and this whole factor is proportional to the um, scattering factor that is um, experimentally assumed to be around one for most cases, and to the charge carry density. Um, so in the scenario that I just described, this is called a static Hall effect. Um, but for highly resistive samples, such as perovskite thin films, uh, by making just this measurement, it would be impossible to distinguish uh, signal from noise. And therefore, typically we apply an alternating magnetic field uh, all at, in order to distinguish the, the signal from the noise. Uh, so we applied here my alternating magnetic fields and uh, we read the alternating resistance signal. And from this, um, the uh, semiconductor type was found to be N-type, good news. Uh, and the charge carrier density was calculated to be at the order, well, at the, at the level of 10 to the power of 13 per centimeter cube. Uh, now, this value is in agreement with other um, literature values for uh, similar systems, doped and undoped, but it's much lower than the, the example of molecular charge transfer doping with f 40 sin q that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, this discrepancy is, uh, it's an investigation work in progress, uh, and we are still working on explaining why there are so many discrepancies in the literature, and, uh, and voila. So, knowing this, 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 this technique uh, needs a little bit more focus, we move to the mod Schottky analysis. And uh, Mod Schottky is based on the fact that on the um, semiconductor metal junction, uh, we could create a depletion layer. Now this depletion layer will uh, change its thickness depending on the bias that we apply. And we can consider this depletion layer between metal and semiconductor, we can consider it um, a capacitor. So this depletion layer thickness will depend, of course, on the bias, but also on the ionized dopant density. And therefore, by plotting the 
invert that uh, C square against uh, the voltage from the slope of, that, of this plot, we can calculate the ionized dopant density. Uh, for, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Bastien Politi and Professor Rafael Clerc from Santa Team, uh, we measured uh, the, um, the capacitance as a function of uh, voltage for the perovskite layer sandwiched between uh, tin oxide, which created an ohmic contact for electrons, and uh, gold. Now, between gold and perovskite, we inserted an ultra thin layer of uh, insulating PMMA. Uh, that um, had the purpose of decreasing the leakage current. Uh, and uh, well, here are the mod Schottky plots. So we can observe uh, the decrease of the slope for an increase of um, doping concentration. And this corresponds to an increase of uh, ionized dopant density. I plotted uh, this uh, ionized dopant density against uh, the doping concentration. And we can see that uh, the ionized dopant density is in the level of 10 to the power of 17, while the um, uh, doping concentration calculated from uh, from the XPS is on the level of 10 to the power of 20. So in order to elucidate this discrepancy, I measured uh, the conductivity as a function of temperature in order to calculate the activation energy of the dopant. And here, the first thing we can observe that at room temperature, um, the activation energy for doped and undoped perovskite is very, very similar. It's around uh, 100 million electron volts. So we can see that the conductivity increased, but the slope, so the activation energy didn't change. This uh, leads to the conclusion that uh, at room temperature, the main uh, obstacle for the uh, charge. So the main limiting factor of the charge transport uh, is probably grain boundaries. Below room temperature, at lower temperatures, uh, charges can tunnel through the grain boundaries, and therefore we can read, uh, let's say, the real activation energy of the dopant. And this one was calculated to be around 350 uh, millielectron volts. Mm. So to make sure to, to confirm this theory, uh, we asked uh, Basti and Rafael to simulate mod Schottky plots for different uh, activation energies. And so we can see this uh, solid gray line represents a zero activation energy. So all the dopant that is introduced uh, to the structure is uh, to the to the perovskite is activated and result in it is in fact the ionized uh, dopant. So we have 100% here. Then as we increase the activation energy, this, uh, mm, let's say this curve flattens and the slope uh, increases. And uh, we can observe that uh, less of the introduced dopant is ionized. Uh, by probing the um, density found in the XPS for the activation energy calculated from the Arrhenius plot, so 350, we can see that the level of the ionized open density is around 10 to the power of 17. So <clears throat> mm, this uh, shows that at room temperature, most probably the majority of uh, the dopants is uh, freezed out. It's, there's a freeze out um, uh, phenomenon that occurs. Um, so conclusions. Uh, I developed a method to dope substitutionally uh, MAPI, thin film, uh, 
using metastable ions, which results in N-type doping. Uh, this uh, led to the conductivity increase uh, by around three orders of magnitude. Uh, and uh, the dopant is present all throughout the layers. Uh, band cap didn't change. And uh, also photoluminescence quenching was observed. Um, when it comes to transport properties at room temperature, transport mainly occurs at grain boundaries. Uh, and uh, the ionized open concentration at room temperature is around uh, 10 to the power of 17 per centimeter cube. Uh, so this is the one step towards the um, new generation perovskites, DOP perovskites, where you can create um, devices based on pin junction. And this can open new chapters for electronics and notably transistors uh, or um, offer detectors. So there's an open field for plenty of devices. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge my supervisors from my PhD, uh, Lionel Hirsch, Dario Bassani, and Sylvain Chambon. Uh, this is my our team and uh, research funders. And thank you very much. And I can see that there is already a question.